everyone, Darren here, and welcome back to Satisfactory. Now today, we're going to be going back into my copper and Caterium factory and adding the final refineries. That'll allow for the creation of over 1,462 copper sheets per minute, 600 of which will be sent into assemblers to make 120 AI limiters per minute when combined with quickwire that we've already set up. This build is huge. It's taken probably near a hundred hours just in and of itself and you can find everything you need to build along if you're up to the task in the previous videos and the description of this one which contains the blueprints the save files and all the production documents you need i also just want to say thanks for all the support on the series so far remember if you enjoy it consider leaving a like subscribe if you haven't already and share my videos with friends or in communities you think you might enjoy it if you have no friends consider joining my Discord, discord.gg slash WDP, and maybe make some there. All right, let's begin. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what you see before me is the Iron Factory. That's right, this is the factory that we were building in the previous video, if you managed to catch that. If you didn't, don't worry, but I also went in and did a live stream doing a lot of the cosmetics. Something I just really quickly wanted to ask people here at the beginning of the video is if you would like to see a tour of this factory and every factory that I've done so far, which is about seven or eight, dotted around the map here, the quartz crystal, the power plant, the liquid biofuel, the steel. If you would like that to be its own dedicated video where we just go around, look at the world, look at everything running, uh, if I don't actually have a power pole near me, but power is nice and consistent, so I'm sure everything is running efficiently, but show you the numbers, the blueprints, and the particular video that was involved so that everybody be, can be caught up onto the same page. Let me know if you would like that, or if not, that's totally fine, but just say, I'd rather you move on. So please do leave a comment on it because it will take out one of the videos in the weekly rotation. Instead of doing a factory build, I'll do a world tour as to where we're currently at. So please do let me know in the comments. I really want your feedback on that because some people have asked for it, but you never really know what the sentiment is. It could just be, that, you know, a, a loud, a vocal minority would like to see that, but maybe most people just don't care. Okay, so with that out of the way, what we're going to be focusing on today, of course, is the Copper and Caterium Mega Build. That's right, just when I thought I was done, they pull me back in. And of course, there was always a component to the factory that wasn't done. Actually, there's kind of several components that's not done. Some of the cosmetics on the roof isn't done. We need to add a train station to actually carry the stuff out. And there's an empty room that's been left designated for steamed copper sheets, an alternate recipe for the copper sheets that we just managed to pick up recently that allows you to mix water with some copper ingots in a refinery to get the exact same amount out. 22.5 in, 22.5 out. So pretty good. So we're going to be using that recipe today. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have machines, logistics, power, upgrades, and then some cosmetics if there is any time left. This should be pretty much the last time we work on this factory in terms of adding machines. In the future, it'll only be for upgrading what already exists and then for adding the train station so we can actually export all the things we make in there. Now, this factory was a massive undertaking, just a huge undertaking, far bigger than you should really ever consider doing at this stage in the game. And you'd be totally within your right and totally fine to not tackle it until later because we don't actually even power it on right now. That's because there are currently 364 refineries in there with, I don't know, something like 30 or 40 water extractors beneath them. Huge, huge power draw to all that. It's something around 20,000 megawatts when you consider the assemblers and constructors that are sitting on the top floor as well. And of course the truck stations and everything that goes along with it. Now, I just realized I'd run into the factory and I was about to start building and I realized I haven't really talked about how this place works or any of the numbers or what anything means. I just feel like it's good to be all up on the same page, especially for those who may not have seen the build before or if you've just forgotten because it's obviously so complicated and the videos have been so long in the past that a little refresher I think would do us all good. So, we've got four truck stations here in front of me. This is the first port of call for the factory. This is where we receive our copper ore. So... Out on the world map, we have all these little points here called copper extraction points. And one truck at the moment is designated to go to each one. They pick up their material, they drive along the roads, and then they come back and deliver it into this factory. The total number, I think, is around 5,400 copper ore in terms of the potential that this factory can receive. So we can just basically keep scaling up the amount of miners that we have and keep delivering it in here, and things will be fine. The trucks are orange, they come in, they loop around, and they hit this one first, then this one, then this one, and then this one. So they're dropping them off in a manifold style. So the one on the end is the one to get the least and it'll take the longest before it fills up. 
We then have a Caterium one that does the same thing, but it's just a single truck station on its own because the volume is much lower. And then we have a station here for hand, uh, taking in coal uh, because basically it's going to be refueling the other stations. All right, so we can see a little truck delivery going on right there. Totally fine. So the copper ore is going to come in and it goes on to eight belts in total because, of course, there are two belts coming out of every truck station. So eight is the maximum amount that we can kind of have traveling along it. Each belt can hold 780 copper ore in the future when we update it. Now, at the moment, they're just Mark three belts. And at the moment, I haven't fully upgraded. Oh, no. At the moment, I haven't fully upgraded the miners or the belts out in the world. So we can totally get these two to be active. We just have to add on another copper extraction point, and that'd be totally fine. And we'll do that probably by the end. All right, so we follow these all around, and we can see that they actually are designated to go to certain letters. So what's that about? So basically, every belt goes to two blocks. A block is 26 refineries. A refinery that does copper ingots consumes 15. So if we were to say 780 divided by 15, you'd have 52 machines. Divide that by two, and you get 26. A block is 26, two blocks is 52. So this is going to a single group, sorry, it's not a single, a group of two blocks A and B. On the other side, this is going to H and I, J, K, L, M, M, and N. So there are 14 in total, 14 letters in total, 14 blocks in total, all doing copper ore, or copper ingots. Now every block, we've got 52, 26 per block. We know that there's 14, so that's 364 refineries. 364 refineries times the max amount of copper ingots they can produce is 37.5. The capability of this factory is 13,650 copper ingots per minute. It's quite a lot. So as the ore travels in here, it makes its way down into the belt release room, which is just downstairs, and then it'll come back up to go feed into all the various machines. So we'll just go downstairs and have a look at the belt release room and talk about why that even exists. So this is basically it. We can see out to the right is the basement where all the water extractors are. Underneath all of the various blocks that they feed, every group of water extractors feeds two blocks, which is why they have a lot of spacing between them. Okay, so we have eight awesome sinks, every, for each one for each belt, and every belt just goes into a little buffer, and then it goes into a smart splitter. Now, unlike most smart splitters, you're not sending the overflow into an awesome sink. I'm sending the direct throughput to an awesome sink, and the overflow is going out. That's why there's no overflow moving right now, because the awesome sink is powered on. Some lazy cable management would show you that all of the awesome sinks are hooked up to their own little power switches upstairs. And if we want, we just switch off the, power, the awesome sink, and then the belts will flow. So that's why I've called it a belt release room. If we flip some switches, the belts will then flow into the factory. So at the moment, we just have them all not going into the factory. The factory is, for lack of a better term, powered down. Just the awesome sinks are powered on. Now, because I don't have 20,000 megawatts of power at my disposal, at least not yet, you know, ideally in the future we'll have that and we'll just turn everything on and leave it on, but because we don't have it right away, we have to be a little bit picky and choosy and very deliberate with which refinery blocks we power on, and then overall, which ones we decide to commit to making the sheets. So, if I just quickly build you a little map of the overall layout of this place, so this has been placed before, it was actually built when I first made the factory, so I haven't actually updated it yet. But this is the overall layout of all of the blocks. So this would be your... Let's just pop out here for a second, okay? Yeah, we've got 14, so 7 on each side. So there are 7 blocks here. So that's going to be A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And then on this side, we have H, I, J, K, and so on. And then in the middle, we have the outputs, right? So the outputs travel upstairs to a logistics floor where we handle all that stuff. The Caterium blocks are named a little bit differently. They are X, Y, and Z, as opposed to the beginning of the letters. They're, they start from the end of the alphabet. Right, so with that established, we'll just run back down into that power room, have a look at that map again, and talk about which ones are going to be designated copper sheets. So, at the moment, A, B, C, and D just make ingots, and they don't go anywhere. Blocks E and F make quick wire and wire. So their ingots are already designated to go somewhere. G and N don't go anywhere. And then we have M and L, which also go for wire and quick wire. So basically this one, this one, this one, and that one, those are the only ones I'm actually using right now. Can I get rid of this for a second? Yeah, so basically the ones that are highlighted in red are the ones that are going off to be made into other things. But all of the other ones 
are unassigned. So what I'm going to do is assign G and N are going to be the other two blocks that are reserved. So these are the ones that are the furthest away from kind of where we are right now and the, the top of the factory that we just looked at. We were standing about here when I pointed out the machines. All right, so that's the idea. So N and G. Now, each block makes the same amount, right? They all make 487.5 copper ingots per minute twice. They all make it twice. So you can see G links to G and G, right? So every block is broken into two rows. Each row makes 487.5. So two 487.5 and another one there. So we're going to use three of the outputs to make the copper sheets. So one of them is going to be left unassigned. So it's a little bit messy, just slightly, but not too bad. It just means that this, this, all of those blocks and this one are then free to go into train stations in the future and ship their ingots around the map. That's the idea. All right, let's get rid of this. I think that's enough explaining. Let's get to work. So we're going to need 39. Uh, 39 refineries making copper sheets, this new blueprint here. And we're also going to need something like 42 power shards. So previously, I'd left two blocks here empty designated, ready to go for copper sheets. But I've decided to change how that works. And the main reason is because of the 487.5. To make building and logistics a little easier, instead of using two full blocks, we're going to use a block and a half, but not really make a block at all. Instead, it's just going to be three rows. But we can still start from a similar point of view. So if we start here, all of these blocks are 18 by 7. All right, so this should go all the way down to 18. So that was 18 foundations across, right? Like that. So what we're going to do is count down to 9. All right, and that's our halfway spot right there. And I'll just need to discard some stuff on the ground for a second. We'll pick that up in a minute. And just chop this bit away and chop the bit away below. All right. Bring this in. Bring that to there. So just putting in my little temporary floors. This is all stuff we've done before, if we were, if you'd ever watched before building the uh, previous factory. Now, or the rest of this factory, I should say. All right, so all of these are going to be facing the same direction. Previously, I used to do it where they would alternate, but not anymore because there's only three rows, so we don't need them to alternate. We're also going to start at the halfway point. So I'm going to nudge it all the way until we're at the halfway mark. And then on the center of the ninth foundation, either way, we are center aligned and we're pointing the output south, right? The output is going south. So let's commit. So that's our first refinery block in. It's going to take water, ingots, and produce copper sheets, all at the same rate, 22.5 of everything per minute. Now they're going to be overclocked, but we'll get to that in just a minute. They're going to be overclocked differently, which is why I didn't bother doing it in the designer. So we want them to all face the same way, but if you remember, we nudge them one tile. So every time I place it down, lock it in place, nudge it towards me, lock it in place, nudge it towards me, and so on. So I'm creating a gap of one between each of them as we come down. All right, so that just leaves us right on the edge. So there's a gap between each machine, and we're right on the edge overall. I'll just do the same on the other side. All right, that's what we got. So now we're going to count, if you just think of it this way, we basically placed it one, two, three and a half foundations in. So now we're going to count three, three and a half foundations out. So this is our half foundation here. One, two, three. So we're going to start the build on the coated concrete here. So this walkway is not going to be a walkway anymore. All right, that's our halfway point again. So same with this one, just align it there. But now we're going to be going across like so. All right, so we've created our gap just like before. Grab our blueprint, and it's going to be aiming the same way. And it's going to be touching right up against the edge there, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I think so, because that's three and a half. Yeah. All right, cool. So is that center aligned? Looks good to me. Let's commit. All right, there we go. So that's going to be 39 refineries in total. 
And now we'll have to do a little bit of overclocking. So I have to go get my power shards. I didn't have them with me, but we need 42 in total. So it's a kind of a lot of overclocking. I'll talk about that in a minute. All right, I've arrived and I have the requisite 42 power shards in order to complete the build. Now, I thought I should address the inevitable question. Why, oh, why are you using power shards? Wouldn't it be more efficient to build more machines? Why would you use power shards on these? Well, that's a great question. And it's, you're totally right hypothetical internet man or woman. Uh, so basically it's for simplicity's sake and consistency across the build. Originally when planning out this area, there was going to be 52 refineries and they fit. There was no problem there, but I've actually gone for 39 refineries less, but I'm going to be sharding them or power sharding them and overclocking them in order to get the numbers I desire out of them. There's a few reasons I went back and forth with different ways of doing it, but this is just the way I settled on that I think is the cleanest and most simplistic in order to follow uh, and build yourself. However, if you're looking for efficiency, I would just add more machines. Now I'll talk about why. So, how is it inefficient? If you didn't know, adding a power shard or two to a machine to get double the output does not cost you double the power. It costs you double in a bit, right? Let's just say two and a half times the power. It's something like that. Uh, it's not quite a, a one to one sort of whatever you get out is what you're spending for power that's not the case it is the case for the resources in and the resources out you're just doubling that that's fine but the power increase is not exponential but it's like this linear curve that kind of continues upwards on an upwards trajectory um above the amount that you would expect don't really know how the, the language or verbatim the verbiage to explain that any better but that's the that's where you're losing quote the efficiency and also these are sort of finite I say sort of because technically you can get power shards from lizard doggos so you can feed them pale berries they'll go out into the woods they might bring you back a, back a slug and then you could get you know a power shard out of that but it's not a reliable way of doing it you can't automate it it's not a guarantee it's very rng dependent so let's just say for sake of the argument it's basically finite right so where would you want to use them to be more efficient well generally speaking deposits that have whatever resource is a good place to use them because it means you're getting more out of the deposit you can't put a second miner on it so overclocking a miner to get more out of it is a good way to use your power shards to get more material into the world and into the game uh, you could also make an argument that it's not too bad to use it on a power generator because you just get more power you don't lose anything um, but you know you could always just add a different generator rather than adding an overclocker but anyway I digress. So that's where you'll lose your efficiency, just for those who are maybe wondering. All right, sorry about that. My mouse was acting up, but I just plugged it back in and it seems to be fine now. So basically, we we're talking about the numbers and why I've settled on these. So effectively, we have 22.5 copper ingots in and 22.5 out. Initially, when designing the place, there was going to be 52 refineries. So 52 times 22.5 would have been 1,170. That's what I wrote down on the initial floor plan documents that I give out to people. 1,170 ingots will be needed to produce 1,170 copper sheets. But I didn't like that number. The reason being, if you remember, we just went over every block of ingots makes 487.5 times 2. So every block that I have in this build makes 975. They're broken into two rows of 487.5. So 1170 divided by 487.5. It's an awkward, it doesn't divide in nicely. So these refineries here, if there was 52, if they required 1170 ingots, it would have had to bring two full rows and then 0.4 of a row, which you could do. You could bring that over and you could maybe just use an overflow splitter and try to send the rest of the ingots elsewhere. I just felt like in a video that would be quite difficult and tricky to sort of explain. So I decided to work with this number instead. 487.5. That's a nice, nice enough number. 487.5 is the number that actually I'm planning on going into each individual row. So instead, now all we have to do is separate three rows out from our blocks of G and N and send each one into its own singular row. That's the idea. So in order to make that happen, we have to do a bit of weird overclocking. 11 machines, right? So 11 of these refineries, there's 13 in each row. So 11 of them need to be at 37.5 so that's just 150 percent basically is 37.5 so that's 11 plus one of them will be clocked to 45 and then another will be clocked to 30 and that gets us to 487.5 
So we'll start with the biggest one first. So this would be 45, like we just mentioned. The next one will be 30. And then the next one and all of the subsequent ones will just be this maxed out. So we'll just hit copy setting on that. And then we can just go up to each one and just paste them on. All right, so that's it. So basically, the first machine on the row is at 200%. The next machine on the row is at 133.3 recurring. And then every subsequent machine is at 150 all the way down. So that might be a little bit weird in terms of the numbers, I guess, on each individual machine. You could probably find whatever the number is to democratize across them all. I'm not very good at math, but there's probably a number there that's like keeps the clock speed the exact same. I'm sure some nerd in the comments will figure that out. And I say that jealously, not in a derogatory way. So if someone does figure that out, it'd be kind of nice to know. But anyways, I'll probably just keep it this way just for simplicity's sake. Um, so if you wanted to do this without using any of the power shards, I'm not sure what number you need. But 487.5 is what you want to bring into the row. So you would add as many machines as you can down until you get to that with the default clock speed. And you just have to go out and over the truck stations, I guess. So your belt work underneath would look really weird. You could maybe chop away the walkways so that there's just one walkway and you just have lots of different rows. Anyway, I'm sure you could figure it out if you wanted to save on the shards, right? That's totally doable. I'm choosing to take the easy way out and say we're going to have bigger gaps, less machines, and overclock them. Most builds I do won't do that, right? Almost never. But because this is a little add-on here at the end and it just seemed to work out mathematically, it's like, well, there we go. All right, so hopefully that's explained. So we can tick that off the list and say that is now machines done. The first little logistical challenge here is how do we get the ingots into these machines? We know that there's three rows of machines. We know that each row requires 487.5, and we know that that's a perfect number for the rows that are producing them off in the distance out in that direction. So, they're on the same floor, and the ingots are made downstairs. You could just travel them straight along on the same floor and go into these machines. But we're going to instead keep the consistency of using those glass cases, the risers, that send the ingots up to the above floors. But we're just going to pull them down here. So we'll have two glass risers for this particular set of ingots. They're going up and then back down. That way we keep the consistency of having that effect. Um, but also we just maybe... Don't have a bit messy belt work downstairs. So we have to look for the halfway point on this wall. It's going to be 12 there. So six. So that's six. So that's the halfway point. So here and here. So if this is the halfway point, what I plan on using, I'm just going to pop that down for a second, is a set of three, right? We just need three. And we'll just grab a two meter foundation here. All right. So one, two, and three. So that's our glass case area for the ingots that'll be coming down. Now above me is ventilation, so it's just one foundation thick, but that's fine. Alright, and if we use conveyor mark four, just bring that right in there. Is that the right way? Yeah, because it'll be output downstairs. Good. Alright, and when we get to the cosmetics part of things, we'll put the actual um, glass around it. Okay, so that's where the ingots traveling down. So let's go upstairs now and see on the next floor where we need to put the floor holes, right? So this is maintenance slash ventilation. Now, thinking about it actually, the floor above us is probably going to be quite busy. Let's have a look. Yeah, we're smack bang in the middle of where like... AI limiters and stuff are going to be made. So let's leave it. We're not going to go up to that floor. We're going to do something a bit different. And we'll actually use the maintenance floor slash power floor to travel a belt. I know. It's, it's criminal. It's heinous. But it has to be done. So we're going to have to send our three belts over to that location. Alright, so all the way down at the end of the factory here, we have four little lone floor holes. Right? The other eight that are right there in front of me, that would be blocks, I suppose, EF and L and M. So the four blocks have eight outputs, and that's all going upstairs to make quick wire and wire. Whereas we have just four here, and we're going to use three of them. So this one, I'll probably leave on its own. So facing north, the one on the top left, these three, we're going to use those. They're all making four, all have the capability, I should say, of making 487.5. So what we're going to do is grab the Mark IV, and we'll go all the way up to the top, but then down one, just so that we're not clipping. Let's wait for the autosave. All right. 
Shoved a few cheeky Doritos in there while I was waiting. Um, so let me just think about this. Excuse me. So we're going to be using conveyor ceiling mounts. We'll just need to go out a bit further before it connects in. So, like so. Is that right? Actually, it looks like it's maybe not. I think it's there. Yeah, there. One, two. And then connect. All right, cool. Now, instead of just dragging these the whole way, I'll put the poles down first. I think we've got f seven foundations. Two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, before they need to be connected in. So just doing this, this, and this. So then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So let's just test that and see is that a good enough distance using our new Mark IV belts. Yep, the distance is fine. So we kind of, I mean, this is the maintenance floor, as I say. We lose the cool effect of seeing the belts here, but that's what the glass risers are for, going up and going down. It does keep things out of the way, I guess. So there we go. So that's traveling all the way around to blocks N and G. So we're taking two from G and one from N. So N still has one row left. So 487.5, that can go on to the train station or somewhere else if we decide to build anything else in this place in the future. All right, here we are. The three outputs ready to go. Each one carrying 487.5 copper ingots per minute ready to, rece to be received into the three input rows. Number one, number two, and number three. All right, we have the CC refinery logistics. The eight, six, four, and two meters. That was to help us with going up and over each other. But we don't need that this time because we're not crisscrossing belts. We've made things quite simple by having them all do the exact same amount and having three rows for each output um, so that's the benefit there at work right the downstairs area has been made a lot more simple because we decided to overclock the machine so using the four meter one i think is what i'll go with turning we don't need blueprint mode on actually thinking about it right so that's on the seam this is on the seam and then we need them to be directly underneath so that's directly underneath and it's on the seam and this is just borderline cutting through, but it's not at the moment, so that's good. And that's going to be, that part is going to be deleted. So just making sure that that's correct. Seems all good. Let's commit to just one side first before we do any more. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like we are lined up. Okay, good. So as long as we're lined up, we're all fine. I'm going to grab this as a blueprint now. Toggle blueprint mode. Aim it the same direction and go one, two, three. And that should keep us aligned the whole way down. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right, so there's going to be a machine on the end we'll have to manually place just because I don't want the blueprints completely overlapping all of that. And all of this side of things is going to be removed. So if we just do this, go all the way down here. So that's me being lazy, right? We didn't make a, a specific blueprint for that, but just getting rid of this to show that none of this is actually going to be used, right? All right, there we go. So we're left with a nice clean line of splitters and junctions for our pipes. All right, so we'll start with the top down just to connect all of these junctions. That usually works best when you're looking at them head on and starting from the top down. Prevents any of that, this stuff happening where it's like trying to go under or over. That can happen to this as well. So I feel like if you start from this, go down, it looks best rather than going like here up because it might actually attach to the top of it, not the bottom. Bit weird. This is just a better way to guarantee that it works, I think. Doing the lifts is easy enough. It's just mark one the whole way down. They snap right in. Not a problem. But one thing we are going to have a problem with is the water. All right, there we have it. All the inputs are now ready to go. I actually had enough material on me to make it mark two pipes. I had a bit of plastic on me from the coated concrete and also mark four belts. So it's pretty much ready. Now, remember, it'll be 487.5 per minute. And the belt speed of a Mark IV belt is 480. So we're 7.5 per minute short. So until we get those Mark V belts, this will never run at full capacity. Although, it's a bit silly saying that because really the amount of ingots and sorry, the amount of ore that would need to be coming into the factory in the first place would warrant having a Mark V belt. So that it's not even due to that. It's a bit more of a fundamental problem. All of these are the ones that need to be Mark V. The ones traveling, bringing all that ore in right now. It's nice to see the top belts filling again. All right, so what we've got here is our three outputs. 
This is bringing our ore into the place. Sorry, our ingots. Now, before I bring it all the way down, actually, thinking about it, we're already raised a little bit. I'm just going to bring this to there. Boom. All right, so that's 487 ingots traveling down onto a belt and into its input rows. Need to do the outputs. The outputs are going to be traveling over here. So I've made three little floor holes now. One, two, and three next to the stairwell. All right, so that's wall one, two, and three. So just coming right down the middle of them, basically. Similar to how we did over on the other side. That's going to be traveling up. So we'll get a Mark IV belt, bring this down to the very bottom, which I think is fine. Because we can travel under, yeah, so that's okay by me. Reverse it, so we're taking things in. And that's where we're going to send everything. So that's going to be the copper sheets, 487.5 per minute as well. So coming out of these outputs, travel it down to the ground, along and in. That's the idea. Alright, that should be that. So now it's as easy as just connecting it all up, right? They should just snap into each other, really, at this point. Alright, did it. So this just needs to aim for that little spot through there. <laughs> One, two. This will be the only instance where we actually travel something along the floor of this place. I didn't need to, but I don't really see the harm in it. Perfect. Alright, great. All right, so this actually worked out better than I thought. So on the final row here, it looks like we are exactly lined up with um, the risers of where it's got to go. And then this one can just follow down the seam and go straight in. That totally just worked out. I mean, I totally planned it, obviously. It's my genius plan. Um, but no, yeah, just worked out really nicely. So that's all well and good. So I think we're fully hooked up now. It's just getting to... Nighttime. Oh yeah, so the only last thing I need to do is just hook up these inputs to go across into their uh, respective inputs, I guess. Allow myself to introduce myself. Yeah, that's all of that sorted then. That's all of the inputs. It just feels weird. For me, this was very quick anyway. I think I just, I'm traumatized by what had to happen out there. And also really what happened had to happen with the quick wire where there was eight belts of 780 and they all had to like crisscross and go up and over each other and stuff. Oh, nightmare fuel. This is going to be sending stuff out. We're taking it in, is that right? Let's just start it from the bottom. <laughs> Probably make life a little easier. Because then it knows what's coming in, I guess. Alright, let's follow that up. So this will be pretty easy. This is the maintenance slash ventilation floor. And unlike the ingots that we traveled along here, we're not going to be doing that with these guys. These are going to go up another layer. All right, so we're connected. So now we go up another floor over to Logistics 2. All right, so this presents us with an interesting logistical challenge. So in front of us, we have the inputs for 24 assemblers that are making AI limiters. As you can see, they've been flooded with their quick wire already. That's totally fine. But they haven't yet received copper sheets because we've never made it here. And none of the outputs are hooked up either. So, over here is our three outputs of copper sheets, each one doing 487.5. And then here is the target belts that I want to line them up with and send them out towards the train stations, which are all the way down there. What's coming in on that stacked belt is irrelevant, but just out of curiosity, it is just lots of ingots that are feeding all of the quick wire machines. Each belt of ingots is going to a row of machines down there, I believe. So that's totally fine. We don't have to worry about that. But because we have free space underneath, it just seems to make sense like to use that stackable pole and send out the two belts of copper sheets. So, let's have a look. We know that 25 is the input on an individual machine for copper sheets. And there's 24 machines. So that's 600 that's needed to be fed in there in total. Or, another way of thinking about it, and this is the way I'm going to do it, is 12 times 25. So if we just look at one of these blocks here, this requires 300 copper sheet. And this requires 300 copper sheet. So what we'll do is divide them both up equally and then re-merge them together on one belt. That's at least my idea. So what we could do to start us off here is go to Mark IV and go 1, 2. Um, and then I'll just grab a belt and we'll just line this one up and send this on its way. So you're done. You're out of here, right? 487.5. See you later. That's gone. It leaves us with two outputs, though, to still work with. So let's grab this one. 1, 2, 
three, four. And this one can be one, two, three, and four. We're gonna aim it that way. Grab this, and we'll just connect this onto some stilts that I just put here before, because I've been testing out different ways of doing this. And just now, like literally just before I started like talking again, I came up with a different method that I haven't tested yet. I was gonna do a weird kind of, it was weird, but now I think I've got a simpler solution for it. So let's see. Anyway, so if we stand here, I think this can just go straight into there now. Without bending or curving in a weird way. And this one might need to go onto some stilts before it can get down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. So let's just line it up so it's right around here. And we'll just send that right down to there. All right, and it has to go in here. But we wanted to do it smoothly. One, two. And in. Okay, so each group is doing the same thing. It's traveling in, going all the way down this way, and then it loops around, comes back, and goes all the way back down. So technically, this one is the one on the end of the manifold, if you want to think of it that way, right? It's the end of the manifold. And that's the same way the quick wire has been done below, actually, pretty much. All right, so looking good. But we're sending in more than we have to. So the thought, very simply, was to somewhere here create two overflow splitters and then merge them together and send them back out this way. So I gotta work that out now, basically. I've done this like a few times now where it's all been wrong, so I just wanna make sure. I mean, I've never run the machine or anything, but I've just realized it's not right. Okay, now the idea was that would go straight in there, but I think it's gonna have to bend around to do that. So we could just send it into that side instead or something. Uh, just to make it look a bit nicer. So one, two, and there we go. All right, so that's the output again. So let's make it mark four, why not? And that's all mark four. So now we can just do this. Oh, well actually, I wanna go to that spot there, but we can't go quite up to that height without just raising this. So one, two, up and there okay so that's been merged so hopefully that makes sense i know it's a little bit messy looking but basically these two outputs are traveling along they go down into their own smart splitters each the overflow of which will travel out merge together and then be sent out on that line there so if we do uh so 600 is what we're taking away from this because of the two combined so if we do 487.5 times two Right, 47 times 5, 0.5 times 2, minus 600. So 375 is what should be left on this belt as it travels out. So we have a 487.5 and a 375. And they're going to travel and make their way out towards the stations. So just to follow this, the 487.5 as it goes in for the first time, it'll be flowing down this way, flowing down and down, and it goes all the way down. It curls around the machines all the way down here again and then this is the end of the manifold this is the last one of the manifold so only when this starts to really get backed up will then will the overflow kick in and stuff will start being sent out that way so the same is just happening down here it's just a longer belt right this one just goes further down it eventually goes in it goes all the way down and around and so on and so forth right it ends over there so these are the outputs Right, because there's so much on screen, I've decided to color the output mergers red, just so we can exactly see what's going on. So I've hooked them up now to their lifts. They all need to just mark one. We're only making five AI limiters per minute in one machine. So for the 24 machines in total, that gives us 120. So we have the six that are here. So that would be 30 along this belt. We merge it then into another belt of 30, right from the other row. But then, I just keep it separate. I decided not to merge it into the other group. I wanted to keep the two groups separate. It's a small little symmetry thing, I guess, for me, where I'm sending it out now onto this belt here, right? So this is a big belt of Caterium ingots, but on the bottom, there's nothing there. So similar to the copper ingots that are traveling in over there, we're sending out copper sheets on two belts on the bottom. And now, where we're receiving Caterium ingots in, we're sending out AI limiters on the bottom. And I just think there's something kind of nice about that. Also, for troubleshooting purposes, if you end up having an issue where one of the lines is stuttering, you can trace it back to one group or the other a little bit quicker. I mean, you could obviously do it just fine 
if it was one belt of 120, but I just thought I would justify or talk about why I made that decision. So this one, these guys are on the ground and it travels into this merger. And then this kind of comes up to that point, whereas this one is raised, it goes into the back and then up. So that's how I did it or decided to do it in the end. Um, yeah, so I guess that's pretty much us hooked up. So basically these belts can now just travel all the way down to the end and I have to put them into some sort of container so that we can actually turn these machines on and make some. So I'm going to be very lazy and do what I've done here, which is just grab a few containers. Really one container actually would be fine for this area. And it says AI limiters. This was written a while ago. But yeah, so this would be AI limiters question mark coming in. And we'll just send one in there, just really lazily. And then this other line that's going going to be coming in. God, my own accent is weird, isn't it? Just randomly, like just there, I was like going. Like, where's that from? <laughs> I'm not trying to put it on, I'm broken. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, we'll just bring this up to about here, whatever. And then just send that in there. So that should be AI limiters going into that big container. We've got quick wire into that one. We have wire into that one and cable into that one. So... Ideally, in the future, we'll be going over there where the train station is. So we'll have to probably go up and over or under the wire that's flowing in that way. But other than that, we're all our outputs are pretty much ready. It's just we need a train station to send them into. Right, so for the water, starting at the initial intake pipe, basically from... How far back do we need to go? This will have to be pushed up fairly significantly forward. So about here, I think in line with that. Let's just have a look down below. Yes. Right, so then using the blueprint that we've used before, the floor, pipe, pump, and valve. That's it. I want to bring this here, but we're going to orientate it in the opposite direction that we have previously. So it's going to actually be aiming out. So once we're locked in, that should be good. Now it's going to be one to one, so we'll just send this pretty much around into there, but maybe we can make it look a bit nicer. Alright, so that's how it's going to go. So we could just upgrade that bit, and that, and that. And we could check this. It says 600, so that's fine. Okay, cool. So there you go. So that's just one done. So we're going to do that on every row. Uh, so right next to that intake pipe. So that's where we should be putting the thing. So what we could do is just use our blueprints, grab the floor, pipe, pump, and valve again. Aiming it towards me this time. Just shift that over so it's in line at least. So then we have to move it so that we're aligned correctly. And we could just get, change out the um, foundations. So that's not a big deal. All right, good. So that's done now as well. That was actually pretty quick. Okay, cool. So pipes are all upgraded. So 600, so that's totally fine. Okay, cool. So there we go. Our pump, pipe, and valves are in place. So now we'll have a look downstairs and try to match what we've done on the other side of the build, actually, which I have no recollection how to do that. All right, so I'm just down in the basement. I've actually gone ahead and built one row of water extractors myself just to kind of re-familiarize myself with how to do it. And it's funny, I actually had to look up my own video to see exactly what I did in the spacing. And it was just kind of funny for me, at least, because I had to kind of look at it and go through it several times and replay the same moments over and over again and be like, why can't he just hold the camera damn still, you know? So I feel like I'm kind of on the other side of things now, which is interesting perspective. Right, so we're aiming for that floor hole. If you remember, when I built this one, this was actually off-center from the world grid. We placed the blueprint down, and then I shifted it. Whereas the other ones are just placed on a foundation just fine, so they shouldn't be a problem. But they are on the seam of two foundations. So we need to build directly underneath it. It's kind of hard to see, but directly underneath that one. Go straight out in the line. This foundation will be turned into catwalk crossing in the future, but just for now, we'll just extend it further down. And we're going to be using Mark II pipes, but just to get us started, I'll start with a Mark I pipe and bring this down. Oh no. See, I've had this issue before. This is a really weird one. If you see the way it's coming down, it's not connected. It's kind of good to showcase this in case you run into this issue. Yeah, it does not want to behave. All right, so what's happening here is I think it's being latched onto backwards. So we'll just go up to the top and delete the the pipe from that side. So what I mean by that is basically this. I think, I mean this, hmm, it shouldn't be the case. But anyway, I think if we delete this and just leave it disconnected for a moment, we should be able to connect it on the bottom just fine. 
Again, it's just floor hole pipe shenanigans. There's a, a better word that I can probably not have to censor. Um, but yeah, it's just shenanigans. Pipe shenanigans. It's still not fixed yet. Right, so let's try it again. I'm going to go back with the pipeline mark one. There we go. It works. It does work then, so... That obviously was the problem. I don't know why that would be the problem, because it's been blueprinted and it worked before, so... <laughs> don't know. Alright, anyway, we're going to extend that out. So, dragging it and connecting it to the, the seam of the two foundations here. So, it starts on a seam, right? That's where it came down from. We're going exactly one foundation across. So grab this. Extend it pretty much as far as you can go, because we're going to be chopping it away in a moment anyway. That should be good enough. Right, so, then we'll grab our pipeline junction cross, and we want to say from that first seam, that's a number one, that's a number two, and that's a number three, so we'll lock it there. Having that one placed in allows us to now hold control and snap this one in. We see the pipe flicker, so we know it's working. Get rid of this now. Grab a water extractor, hold control, bring it right over the edge. It's kind of interesting, actually. I wonder, is it going to be encroaching too much on those rocks? But I think it'd be okay. Anyway, so that's aligned with the junction now, so we'll just hold control and place more. Ah, I'm lacking some material. Don't worry, I've got some right up here. That's what we need, reinforced iron plates. Oh, I can't pick it up. There we go. All right, anyways. So latching onto that, hold control and just place more down. Five in total. So we're going to be aiming to produce 487.5 water. If we divide that by the five extractors we have, that means that every extractor needs to be set to 97.5. So 97.5. Unfortunately, you cannot copy and paste the rate of the machine to the other ones. So it's kind of annoying. So what you could do is actually, if you, if you were lazy, uh, let's say it's 120 times 4, right? That would make 480. So it, all this would need to be is 7.5. The others could all just be left as standard. But there's something in my brain that tells me it's just better to have them all the same. I don't know, 7.5 seems so low to run a machine at 6%. I'd rather they all just run at 81.25. So that's what I'll do with all of these. We'll just set them all to be 81.25 or just say 97.5 here. Totally fine. All right, so they're all set. Uh, next thing's pretty easy. We'll just hold control and these should just line up now with the outputs. Did that go too far forward? No, that's okay. Okay, so that's all good. Uh, so what's the next thing? It's the pumps, right? So we'll grab this and we'll look at the center point of that foundation. And that's down as an anchor so that when we take out our pump, we can hold control and it'll just latch onto it. Now we can grab the pump again aim it the correct direction, hold control, and it'll snap onto that hologram, and the same thing again, snap onto that hologram. Just wait for this autosave to clear. Alright, autosave is out of the way. So now, the next thing then would be the fluid buffer. So the fluid buffer I've been placing here, I think. And let's pop that in there. And that in there. Alright, looking good, but we've got problems, right? Because of the shenanigans in the game, we'll type for our scaffolding blueprint. And I'll just widen out the foundations here just temporarily so we can avoid this issue before it happens. So, right, scaffolding. Place it down, I think about there is where we need it. And that should wrap around nicely. Keeping it on blueprint mode and looking up. And again... Alright, so now what we can do is go all the way to the top and delete the pipe the entire way up. So this keeps our pumps where we want them to be. They're at the correct height, but we're deleting the pipes because there's a bug in the game where pipes break when placed when a pump is placed onto them and there is a floor hole. So it's a nasty thing, so you might as well just, once your pumps are now in place, just reconnect your pipes and you should be totally fine. I'm going to start from here down, actually. It might be better, no? Uh, maybe not. We'll start from there up. Yeah, once we can see the height of it not going through all the way, that seems like it's right. Okay, so grab actually, we need Mark 2 now. Mark 2, no indicator. Grab this one and just connect it down to its buddy. And then finally this one again. 
So a little messy, but it just means like, okay, you're kind of just putting the pipes down initially to get the positioning of all the things. And then once that's down, you just redraw the pipes just in case there's some bugs with them. Just in case. All right, and it's as easy as that. So we'll just get rid of all the scaffolding now. And that's what we're left with. So we're left with a clean pipeline with a couple of pumps on it. We actually do have the next tier of pump, don't we? But I need motors to use it. I don't have a motor factory, um, but you could just place one, I think. It'd probably take you the whole way. Oh no, because that's two, four, and six. Yeah, you'd probably still need two. So, I don't know, it's fine. I'll just use Mark 1 pumps. I don't really mind seems fine to me. Um, okay, so I just have one more row to do, and then we'll just have to hook these up to power and we'll be good to go. So I just need to connect that one, which is kind of hard to see, but that one over there. Alright, so in thinking about doing power, I realized that there's no belt release system for the copper ingots that'll be flowing back down. Now the reason you'd need that is if you want to be able to prime these refineries with their water first. So I'm extending out the floor here and I'm just wondering how I can fit this, oh excuse me, how I can fit this in. So we're quite close to the pipes here, so, hmm, we need three, we need three assembl- uh, awesome sinks, I always call them assemblers, so let's just see, if I was to put one right here and turn it that way, can we sneak that in? We can a little bit, I like the look of that, alright, so one, two, three, maybe, so it's just two, and this one as well then, one, two, alright, so they're tucked in quite close, that's alright though. They're not overlapping each other, and then there is space for the belts to flow along this way. Now, there's only maybe half a foundation's worth of space here before we start encroaching on that. So I could go for it, see what it looks like. Two meter half foundation, place that down. Alright, so with those in place, now we need to be able to feed them properly, so I'm gonna get a, just a regular splitter for a sec. We'll upgrade them in a moment. So on the seam here, that should be enough space for the elevators to go in, with the lifts. And hopefully enough space to cross around. Let me just check. You pop that here. Yeah, that is the pretty much the space that you'd need. Okay, well, we'll just have to work with it. So that'll be a smart splitter. This will also be a smart splitter, but this will be here. And then the next one is gonna be... One, two... Three, and then one, two, and three. And that should match these stacked poles that we have. And it should match what we've done on the other side. So that's going to just come straight down and go in like that. That's going to go down and in. And that one's just going to go straight across. So, they'll have to be smart. Holding control, we can just replace them. I hope that connection stays in place. Let's test it out, I guess. If you don't see me redoing it, then it means it did work. <laughs> Uh, right, and we'll just send these in. Mark 4. They need to be Mark 4 and Mark 4. So this is where it was coming down from, right? These are the three areas where it comes down, and I've cut a hole now to see where we're ending up. So this needs to get back up to here. Or we find a different place for it and just divide them up separately then. Which you could do. You could just send them straight out, like, straight out from here, maybe. Yeah, this could work. Okay, so unfortunately I'm going to have to delete the kind of belt work I did in the beginning to divide up the logistics for everything else. Just gonna get rid of that. So we're not feeding any of the areas anymore. So that when we come up, it's just gonna go straight into this row. So that's gonna be right in front of the row that it needs to go into. The next one over will be like here, and then the next one over will be there. I'm just gonna seal these back up just for now before we do cosmetics. So now, Mark 4, we'll roll around, and we go in. This one, we'll just go same height, right? Alright. In you go. I dare say it's actually more elegant than it was before. And then finally, this one's going to come up and probably just travel above this belt, seeing as that just seems to work out. <laughs> totally planned. And then I guess it'll have to do a little turn down here somewhere. All right, so there we go. So the three outputs are here now. One goes straight into its first row, the next one down to the middle row, and the next one all the way down to the far row by just doing a little curve and then going in. That doesn't um, solve the problem here that we have now, which is the ingots that are traveling down from the floor above. We'll need to shift them over and get them to their starting position. And I'll just have to judge how we need to line these up, so... All right, so we're on the... we're dead on the seam. Okay. 
So this is a bit messy, I'll admit, but at least, I don't know, <laughs> at least it kind of works out in the end. All right, so we have our three floor holes to go down. So we need to bring that over to here. But I could just travel along the ceiling, which I think would be the, the easiest way to do that. So let's go up all the way, and we'll just bring this all the way until we clip, and then come down one. Ah, and it needs to be reversed. So clipping, and then in. Clipping, and then in, and then clipping, and then in. And send it in. So then again, one, two. And this will just travel along the seam and then go straight in. I think I'm getting good at the game. <laughs> All right, cool. So we can patch up this hole now. It's not needed anymore. And instead, that's where our... <laughs> it is messy now looking in this place, because it's like, how would you have known to build it this way? But after the fact, I think it's fine. And it keeps our glass cases intact and all of that. So the last thing then is to actually get our belts to go down and then to go back out. So now we've got these three outputs here. Okay, so that's one. that one's good. So we'll go down to that height again. Then it's one, two, three, and four. Five and six? I think so. Yep, cool. And this one just goes all the way to the ground. Easy enough. Yes, yeah, so that's going straight in. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. And then this one's just going to come all the way down to the ground. And in you go. All right, cool. So the very last thing then for this area will be setting those overflows. So we want this to be overflowing out the center and then sending in ingots, copper ingots, to the left. We'll just copy that setting and paste it onto the other two. All right, so they're all good. So it's only when we power these off will that actually kick into gear or kick into effect. So we'll go up to the power room now and have a look at how things are going to be laid out. Alright, so I've named the power switches and given them the appropriate colors. The green, of course, for the belt lock, the water is blue, and the refinery blocks themselves are red. I've named the groups S, so just S1, S2, and S3 for the tr three different rows. So the belt lock system is for S1 to 3, the water extractor is for S1, S2, S3, and so on. Why S? S for sheets, I guess, copper sheets. Also, I just felt like it wasn't close enough to the other letters in the alphabet, so even if we expanded, I think N is as far as we go, so I suppose we could get four or five other ones in there before we hit S if we ever expanded the place, which I don't think I'm ever going to do, but who knows. So and we could always just rename it. So S seems fine to me, so that's how I chose it. All right, so what that means is around the back, the ones that are the red machines, they're going to go all the way upstairs uh, in terms of their power connectors to then feed down to the the basic roof right here, right? So if we want to feed these cables, we go up to the roof, across, and then back down to hide those wires. However, for the belt release system, so the one on the very end here, that's just going to have to go straight down the floors and connect to the awesome sinks. Same with the water extractors, because they're below us. So yeah, I'm just going to start hooking these up now. So this is what the maintenance floor was for. If we look through the hole that we just created in the ground, one interesting little problem I've created is these... Oh no, the belts aren't really in the way, actually. So I've been using cable runners. Steel cable runners is this kind of uh, blueprint that I have. You kind of actually don't need this. People pointed it out to me. I was somewhat aware, I think I did mention it briefly, that with um, the power priority switches in the game now, you can kind of just manage this all with power priority switches rather than having to have run individual lines like this as much as I've done. But I haven't unlocked those yet, and they're kind of expensive in terms of material. So for now, this is our best solution. I still quite like it, actually, after the fact, so it's kind of cool. All right, so they all have their connectors in place. So we know that the that's the belt release system. These are the water extractors, and then these. So there's only three, three refinery blocks. So we'll just connect this straight up to here. And the same with that one, and the same with this one. So they just go straight up. So now the idea would be that we grab one of these nodes, we drag it all the way to the edge here, and you just do this every time, and then just separate them and send them over to their own lines of refineries. 
All right, so we can seal that hole back up. And we just have cables cleanly coming through the seam. That was the idea anyway, at least in certain places. Uh, okay, so we just have the three cables running. One goes down this way, one goes down that way, and one goes down that way and connects into the refinery blocks. Uh, so now we could travel back to our power switches and see, just for an example, if we turn on block S2. Aha, we see one yellow light in the middle, which is what we like to see. So basically, you just need to now connect these across the way. And then each one is then connected. All right, so we're in behind the power switches. And three of these switches that I'm looking at here control the water flow rate. So don't worry about all these. These are just connecting the mains across uh, all the way. So the mains comes into this place and powers all these switches on and feeds the mains down. But anyway, these are the ones that we want to care about. So we'll cut through the ground here and again, see where we end up. Yep, so we're going to come through here. So this is going to have to flow straight down, just like these ones did. I'll just to keep consistency again, I'll just drag this one out. And we'll go straight down. And then we're into the assembler room, which is... To I always call it assemblers. Awesome sink room. All right, yeah, so let's just grab this one. And we'll bring it straight down. Does it matter? It seems like we've brought it to there. That one. And that one. This will have to come down as well, because that's going to go to the awesome sinks, actually. Right. So, now we want to run into some cable runners. So, we'll just see if we can grab some. Yeah, so if there's a gap, we've done it right, because there should be. And we'll just lock that in. So, it's super hard to see, but I'm just going to run back upstairs now. We should see what I was doing with that. That's the cable runners. Right, so in behind these switches, we now have a floor cut open. We have the three switches here that are going to go straight down. This one being for the awesome sinks. These three being for the water extractors. So if we line it up with the poles here, we can get rid of that one, that one, and that one. Because that's going upstairs. So these three can just go away. And then these... I need something to kind of stand on here, actually. Oh, we actually have a... Oh, yeah. It comes with the uh, cable runners. Good job, Darren. I forgot about that. Nice. All right. Um, yep, so this could just go straight down and connect into there, and so on and so forth. So each one's just going to connect up. And in you go. So I know that our three awesome sinks. So I'm going to be lazy with these again before I do some proper cable management. We'll just connect these three to this node here. Whew. All right, so there we go. So that's what we're left with. We're left with a sort of a T-junction of three beams going out to their various three different rows. So I've only done the power for this one so far. So that's all hooked up. So I'll just do it again now for the other one. So we'll try to do it quickly and see if we'll keep this in. <laughs> all right, so we pop this down here. A node connects into that side. It connects into this side, and it goes up and is placed just below the pumps each time. Bonk. All right, so that's hooked in. That's totally done now. Next, we'll just grab this, go all the way down. And then we have our B side. B goes there, connects into that pump, brings it all the way up. Then that connects into that pump. And it's so hard to see because it's so small, but there. And then I know that we have to also just connect into that pump. So I'll just temporarily just let the wire go through the thing. It's fine. All right. And then this can just start its journey here. All right, that should be all the water extractors hooked up. And this is ready to go now as well. So this will call pump activation again. Power switch is off. We'll actually leave the pumps on because they're always pretty much going to be on unless I'm doing some severe troubleshooting. All right, so that is power management now done. Everything has been... Yeah, everything's been hooked up, even the awesome thing. Sweet. So the next thing is upgrades. So I've been accumulating lots of encased industrial beams in the background. I'm going to go out to the various extraction sites and upgrade all of them so that they're now bringing more ore into the factory. And then we can finally turn the place on and produce some copper sheets. Yeah, so basically I'm just cutting the cables on several factories. So that way we're saving a bunch of power. So we just cut this one as well and then check the power line. So you can see, look at the savings on that. So the iron factory, you know, costs us... Uh, the max consumption went from 
3,014 to 4,800. So it's about 1,800 megawatts to run that factory. So that's not too bad. It's a good saving. Cut that off. All right, so with beams in tow, the upgrade process should be pretty simple. All we have to do is just visit all of these little shacks and just adjust the slider so that we're making 300 per minute rather than 270. So let's have a look. So 270, we'll just whack this on up to 300, take this belt and make it a Mark IV. And it's as easy as that. We've just increased our volume. And we just run out of coal in this as I rolled down here. So I've done three of them already, so I just have two more to go. Lots of trucks making their deliveries, love to see it, love to see it. Alright, so what we have to do now is basically take these and upgrade them. Now I'm going to be a bit cheeky. I'm lacking my biofuel, it's killing me. There we go. Gonna be a bit cheeky and not upgrade the ones that we don't need. So we're only gonna be using the two belts for G and N. So these are the ones I'll be upgrading. And that way, these should get backed up faster. Because we're dumping more and more into them now. So it's actually already getting some, so that's great. So yeah, so we're gonna start the upgrade process on these two belts here. G and N. Because those are the ones that are now gonna be making our copper sheets. Alright, so I'm just on the top floor. I've just hooked up the AI limiter machines now, so they're all fully connected to power. Um, so all of these were making quick wire, and they all just got, got completely backed up. So even without powering these back on, we should have enough quick wire to then feed in the copper sheets that we're actually freshly making and produce, you know, a couple batches of AI limiters. So I can't power on the full factory because I don't have the power yet, but we've got enough to at least power on these machines and let our refineries cook so that we can produce the copper sheets that will go into making some AI limiters at the end of the chain. All right, everybody, it's the moment of truth. We're going to go into the power room and switch these bad boys on and see if it all works. I feel like there's just something really obvious that I've forgotten, but we're just going to test it anyway. So the belt lock system is on. We're going to release the belt last. What we want to do is start flooding the machines with water. So we'll turn on S1, S2 and S3. So we'll let the water spool up. We'll actually just go down and check it, and then we'll check the refineries when we turn them on. So we'll just run downstairs real quick. Let's see if our water extractors are on. They are looking good, spooling up. Alright, so I'm not seeing any issues with that. I am seeing that one of these pumps is not connected. Maybe a couple, actually. Did I forget to hook these ones up? Looks like it. All right, that's okay. We got to it before it really mattered. S1, S2, and S3. So this will actually tell us our total power consumption. So we should be totally fine right now. The max power consumption is 3,680. That's with all the refineries hooked up to the network. So we're actually totally good. I was maybe a bit overly cautious turning off some of the factories there. So we've got plenty of room to play with still. However, that doesn't actually factor in the other refineries and other water extractors that need to be turned on as well. So what did I say it was? It was G and N, right? So G and N. We'll activate those water extractors now. And we may as well activate N block and G block. Alright, so now we're shooting up a bit more. That's more like it. Okay, now we're up to 5,350. 40 megawatts, so just shy of our 6,000s. That seems a bit more accurate, and I still haven't yet hooked up the assemblers, actually, the assembly override. Yeah, I gotta actually do that real quick, so just bear with me. Alright, so I'm just gonna activate this assembly override, which should, I think, add the additional assemblers and allow them to receive that quick wire they're waiting for. I haven't tested this, so I think that's the case. So at the moment, what's happening right now, what should be happening in the background, is all of our refineries are slowly filling with water. And once they max out, we'll be able to tell by looking at the fluid buffers or just checking the machines. Okay, yeah, it seems like it worked. So these ones are the ones... Oh, actually, it looks like I'm a little short. 
Oh no, I'm out of cable. Damn. I just need to connect. Oh, actually, I'll tell you what I can do. <laughs> just borrow a bit of cable from here. There we go. We'll just do that a couple times, actually. So, just connecting these groups together. And that way, all of these are ready to go. So, I think they'll be receiving quick wire. No? Yeah, this one is. I wonder if there's something up with that one. Or it could just be the case that the way the lines are, we haven't produced any quick wire on that particular belt yet. That could be the case. Uh, let's just double check. It's going to be a bit messy down here, but we can have a look at what's going on. So all of the machines that were full up are now sending out the quick wire to go in here. But yeah, that's true. Not all of the belts had quick wire ready because not all of the machines could receive the Caterium ore because didn't have the belt speed. So... It's only like the first five or six machines on these rows that could have done it. That's why. So it's not going to be everything. That's okay. That's okay. We'll still... <coughs> oh, God. We'll still make a bunch of... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. AI limiters. Should be fine. But until we can supply the entire groups of machines with everything they need, we can't really fill all of these just yet. But that's cool to see them getting their stuff. All right. Let's see how our refineries are doing and how full they are. The machines are full. That's at least the theory. Let's just check one other group just to confirm that. Not much time has passed since the last cut. Yeah, it looks like they're all full. All right, we'll run upstairs. We'll check the refineries. They should be all full if the buffer buffers are full. That's the theory. I mean, that's what I've observed. Looks like we are. Let's check the one on the very end, just to be doubly sure. I suppose we are using Mark II pipes and everything. Yeah, so I guess we're just filling them way quicker than I was anticipating. That's great. It's not a problem. Um, so with all that full, I think we'll just head down, check the refineries at the very end, see if they're full, and then start producing the ingots. Just want to make sure my pipes aren't broken. Oh, they are broken, actually, here. Yeah, so I've done that before because we couldn't supply all the machines, but now we can. So we can just let the water flow into everything. That's why things are going to take... Longer than I expected. I think it's why I was so surprised that those other ones filled so fast. Because these ones do take a while to fill up. So none of these are done. Oh, actually, that doesn't matter. This side of things is fine. We're only using one half of the, uh, the outputs. Because it's 13 times 37.5. Which is 47.5. So in theory, we actually don't need to send anything down this way at all. I might break that connection. And I could actually break this one as well. Just temporarily, you know. Because really, we're only looking to serve G1, G2, and N1. Or N2. Yeah. So that should speed things up, actually, even further. Alright, so we're going to have to activate the belt lock for G and N. So the lock is now off. Which means copper will start flowing... And there you have it. Copper is flowing. I don't see no gaps, which means it's 480 belt speed the whole way around. And there we are. We're right at the edge of it now. All right. Now we can just glide with the 480 copper ore per minute down to G and N. So even this is going to take a while. This factory is so big. We can like watch ourselves moving on the radar as we like, go down to the area that we're getting to. It'd be kind of cool, actually, to maybe drop some markers here of where the different blocks are or something. Just small markers that... Or even stamps or something. Yeah, I don't know. Might be kind of interesting. Hey, we have our first batches of copper ingots are flowing. Nice. There we go. It works. The system works. And it's going to take a while to ramp up to full speed. But there you go, man. That looks, that looks good. Now, I'm seeing a, a bit more gaps on this side. So maybe there's something not quite right with these ones. Let's go and investigate that. I, I think there might be something to that. All right, that's what you like to see. Just tons of ingots rolling down. So yeah, it'll take a little while for the manifold system to kind of kick in as it gets all its ore. This side, th side? <laughs> this side should be quicker than the other side because we've cut off half of it. Because we only need three outputs rather than the four. So because of that, we should expect to see this belt super full and this one maybe a bit more patchy. Yeah, that's expected just while it's still getting the ore and everything. So, uh, cool. All right, looking good. So that means we can head on over to... As this ramps up and gets up to kind of full strength, we can head on over to our copper sheets and then release the belt for that. 
they come down in full view over here. I forgot about that, so that's quite nice. It allows us to say, like, okay, these are the machines then that will be waiting for the, these ingots to get to them. Uh, yeah, that's quite cool. <laughs> I forgot, I just kind of forgot until I saw it. I was like, oh yeah, there's a point to this. Uh, and of course, those ones are going to be the copper sheets going up. So that'd be kind of nice to see both the sort of interstitial floor zero, we called it, the belt release room. So that's flowing down there, like so, and rolling straight into the various awesome things that we've set up. None of the belt release is on right now, so none of the ingots are actually making their way back out and up to the copper sheets. But we want the belts to kind of get a bit more full before we do that. All right, we're looking a little bit better. The gaps are getting less and less frequent on the two right sides. I think we're pretty much ready to start feeding them. So it's been about seven or eight minutes in total since turning on this place. So not much time has passed. I think in total you're probably looking at maybe 15 minutes before the manifold gets fully up and running. Look at that. How good does that look, huh? Damn, you had to ruin it. But yeah, we're always going to get little gaps for a little while, just until the manifold is completely satiated. But I think it's good enough. We can start sending it into these various machines now. So each one is expecting to receive 487.5. So until these guys reach 480 each, we're never going to be able to satisfy the full demand. We're always going to be point or 7.5 short, uh, just because we don't have Mark V belts yet. All right, so what was this? What are we looking to do? I'm getting so confused. Belt lock S1 to 3. Let's release the ingots. That's going to allow these guys to start receiving what they need. The water extractors are still on and everything, so that's fine. We'll head down here just to see it all at work. So what we expect to see now is through these three little floor holes, ingots traveling back up and out. And we can see some actually doing it already. That doesn't seem right though, does it? That seems very slow indeed. Oh. Well, there's your problem. We got Mark 1 lifts in there. I was thinking something was definitely wrong with that. Flow! Flow! There we go. Alright, let's head back upstairs. Oh yeah, and I actually never really thought about it, but obviously two of these that are making... Look at this! Oh my god, yes! I love it. Just seeing it all flying up there is so good. Right, so one of these belts never goes to the AI limiters, but two of them do if you recall, and I believe it's this one that doesn't. And I think that's S1, that's the one that's coming all the way in from the far side. So it's S1, S2, and S3. It'd be good just to denote these with signs in the future, obviously, just be good to know where things are tracked, so you can track them back if there are issues. So it would be a case that S1, so 2 and 3 are the ones you'd want to look into if you had problems with your AI limiters. So we'll go upstairs now, track that a bit further up. Did I bring them? Yep, all the way up there, looking good. And then we'll just go up to the next floor. Hopefully that's all done as well. I keep, I can't remember what I've done or not. Yeah, it's looking good. And then all the way up to floor four. Logistics. Right, so some of them are just going to be making their way straight out. And then the others are now going all the way over towards the AI limiters, which are already being produced. Awesome. So they're not taking in fresh quick wire. In fact, we'll probably run out of quick wire momentarily, but you can see that some of them have been made into AI limiters already. So that's quite nice. Now, if I had the power to spare, we could just run more quick wire, I guess, a little bit. But it's not e easier said than done. <laughs> but anyway, it's still good. We have our first batches of AI limiters rolling out now. Yes, 840. So 840 is how much we just make in this factory currently. Now, when we get our Mark V belts, we'll get a little bit extra out of it. We'll get 862.5 per minute. So, pretty happy with those numbers. I feel like that's a lot of copper sheets. We can do a lot with that. <laughs> so, I'm quite happy. So, last thing I'm just going to do, we're just going to check those containers, see how full they are, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Yeah, looks like our AI limiter machines are finished. They're all just flickering yellow because they're not receiving any quick wire anymore. All right, so checking the container, we can see just the speed at which copper sheets are now flooding in. And I can just about see the second lot are on their way because the we've run out of um, quick wire. So the AI limiters have stopped production. So now the second belt can overflow and receive everything. And that's actually going to get backed up because it can't handle 480 times 2 on one belt, right? So we are now producing 960. It's not going anywhere. Uh, so it's going to try and just bring in 480 into here and we'll probably get backed up. So we'll probably power things down and I'll leave it at that. But now I have copper sheet production. We've got this big open area ready for a train station when we get to trains. I still plan on doing, what's it called? Uh, we need to do oil next and I also need to do 
a kind of a parts factory. So a factory that's going to make a little bit of heavy modular frames, crystal oscillators, a few of these more complicated things just in the background so that we can actually build a power facility with everything we need in it. Because um, I don't want to tell people like, oh, just manually craft everything. Like, we'll set up a little dedicated space so that then when we need to build 100 generators, you know, it's not like some insane task. Uh, so let's check. Bonk. We have 308. 308 AI limiters. How cute. So, I mean, the capacity was 60 per minute. So, yeah, so about five minutes worth of AI limiters right there. And the full capacity, if we run all the quick wire, is 120 per minute. So, looking forward to that. There's obviously lots of quick wire and stuff that can go into different things in the future. So, anyway, what needs to be done is this all has to be brought over there and divided into several... I think there's going to be something like maybe 22 inputs in total for everything this factory makes. Something like that. Close to that number, anyway. Because I believe Quickwire alone has eight. Uh, and then there's still ingots and loads of things left over that haven't been assigned yet. So, all right. That's going to have to be it for this episode. Pretty chaotic, but it works. The factory now has all the machines that I've ever planned for it. And tons of copper ingots left over. Something like 8,000 that we can then ship and send across the map to other places. Or, God forbid, we expand the factory even further out into the water, maybe out the west. We could send those ingots in to make other things if you ever needed to. But the idea is that we'll just ship the rest of the ingots out from here. We'll ship the wire, we'll ship the quick wire, the AI limiters, the copper sheets now. So that's our copper and Caterium factory pretty much done. So that's going to be it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching and coming with me on this journey. We're going to revisit one more time when we do trains, but we'll also be revisiting to clean up some of these things with a cosmetic stream, putting a roof on this bad boy, painting, doing the floors, things like that, making it look quite nice, hopefully. And uh, yeah, that's what's going to be coming next. All right, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.